Good morning, everyone. So today, I wanted to make a presentation, a short presentation on the introduction to e-commerce. And um, the reason I wanted to do this because rather than just have you read the content, I wanted to actually put some explanations as well to what you're reading. Um, my name is Mike Philogene, and I will be a lecturer for this course, and some presentations will come to you weekly about each chapter, right before we have an exam. Okay. So, if you haven't gotten this book yet, it's the 12th edition of Gary P. Schneider's e-commerce, and it's really an introduction to electronic commerce. In this chapter, you'll learn what electronic commerce is and how it has evolved in the last three waves of development. And we'll speak about the three ways of development so that you can understand how the internet has evolved from the 90s to the early 2000s and now from 2010 to 2021, it will be considered like the third wave, really 28, 2008 to 2021. And we'll speak about different opportunities that you can get from the internet, from e-commerce initiatives and also some of the barriers that you'll face also starting an e-commerce or e-business. This course is really an e-business course, so, and e-commerce is really at the base of it. So you will hear me refer to them interchangeably, but they're not. E-business is bigger than e-commerce. And some of the first things we'll do is actually create a SWOT analysis to, to figure out where the opportunities may be based on your own skills, based on your own strengths, and overcoming some of your weaknesses so you can actually better position yourself to take advantage. Um, we'll speak about what led to the development and growth of e-commerce and the international nature of it. So as you know that once you put something on the internet, it becomes public, anybody in the world can access it. So it's really international in nature. So what is e-commerce? Well, e-commerce began in the United States back in, I would say 1993, you know, all the way up to 1995, probably was before that. But the gist of it is that once you've moved commerce, what people engage in face to face to some sort of electronic mean where you can use zeros and ones to transfer data rather than transfer like applications, for example, then you really move into the e-commerce phase. So e-commerce really went, goes back a little bit further than that, but I'm talking about really the general use of it by the general population, really mostly the 90s. And um, as we've seen, it's, it's something that began in the US, but China is now the leader in online retail sales since 2013. So when we think of e-commerce, it's not something that is strictly bound to the U.S. It's really global in nature. And everyone everywhere is actually engaging in it. More and more sales are being made on smartphones, for example. This is something when I started first building my computer in 1997. That was not the case. Right, phones hardly had internet access. We hardly had data lines, you know, that kind of fast the internet connection that allows for you to actually download videos and things like that was not really something that was so prevalent in the 90s. But China is the world's biggest and largest potential online sales market. The reason for it is because they have the most active users, right? Meaning, in a population of 1.6 billion people, at least 900 million of them are constantly engaged on the internet. And that means that the market for it is about three times as much as in the US. And if you just think about just our population alone and the population of people on the internet in China, they just basically three times more than we have and on any day, okay? So active users on the internet is on an upward growth 
as well. Meaning like everyone is trying to get more and more on the internet. And if you think about COVID, which has kept people home, this is even more the case. So you think about internet messaging chat rooms and um, applications that offer chat and all kinds of messaging sites. They've grown like tremendously in the last year. And you think about Zoom, for example, and the way we communicate now, it's, it's really like changed the world. So sellers in China, they account for regional differences, right? When they're actually creating their websites. And the reason for this is because in China itself, they speak so many different languages. So if you think about the internet, it has to have a way of adjusting to the location, for example. Right, so if you notice that sometimes you go to a website and it has maybe foreign languages on it and it'll ask you if you want to translate it. I've seen it on Facebook recently where somebody would post something in a different language and it would translate it for you. Right, so this is like the capability of the internet nowadays. So if you're building a website, that must be a capability to include so that you can have access to international markets where the language may be different. Right. In this chapter, we address how online businesses have emerged and, and grow to accommodate different culture variants, different variables, for example, like language, like culture, like things that people are not accustomed to and making them more comfortable doing, like making purchases, for example, on the internet. That's not something that people are readily available, readily wanting to do or trusting, for example, right? So let's go back to a little bit of the history of it. The growth that we've seen from the mid 90s to the 2000 is basically because most people are actually able to get a computer into their homes now. Computers used to cost thousands of dollars in the 80s. And it was very, it was very expensive. And the monitor would be like $500. No, it doesn't seem like so expensive nowadays, but I remember my wife buying a, a, an NEC computer and that was $2,000. And that was 1992, right? And an NEC computer would, was considered like a very advanced computer, mostly because NEC was a good brand and they, they had engaged in electronics and some people know about NEC still to this day. So we, we've seen something called a dot-com boom. And that's from the mid 90s to the early 2000s. And mostly this, this was because everybody was excited about the internet, right? Wanted to invest into it. And anything with a dot com in it was a potential for success. So if you think about any businesses were coming out and you had a dot com, you, you were probably in the game. So everybody was like, oh yeah, this is gonna be a winner. It's gonna be a winner. And the cyber world was like the new thing. You know, you, you, you could fight. You, you, you could find anything you want, you know? Well, you could read things <laughs> at the time anyway. So it was a vast resource for everyone, for myself included. I was ready to read everything on the internet because there wasn't that much content to begin with. But as you start searching and diving deeper into it, you realize that some of the stuff is already out there. So from 2000, 2003, we've seen like, a slowdown. The slowdown came because people were starting to be realize that, like, you know what? Not everything is going to make it on the internet. Some companies they've grown, yeah, they've 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 grown because of people artificially pump money into them, but the ideas weren't so great, or the ideas were before their time, for example. So it, it wasn't going to work out. So in 2003, people people were like being a little bit smarter in how they invest their money into the internet. So now, most of what you're seeing is a recycling. So some people who went bust, for example, in 2000, 2003, their equipment went to sale for cheap. I remember that if you were bought if we were bought if we bought a router back in the late 90s that cost like thirty thousand dollars to route because everybody thought they were going to have a hosting business. That was why that was what was widely considered to be one of the first businesses on the internet is hosting. Because what you saw yourself as is a person who can host other people's content. 
And that's actually the still to this day, the biggest business on the internet hosting and internet hosting, just so you know, is like, it's not easy, but it's really very intuitive. And it's something that everybody can get into. So that's actually one of the first businesses you can do on the internet is hosting. So from 2003, people were rebuying other people, other businesses who didn't have such a great business model. They were buying their equipment for cheap. So a $25,000 router became like something you could buy for like $10,000 or $5,000. So other businesses came out and they were able to actually use some of these old resources for cheap and start better businesses, if you may. So 2003 saw a sign of rebirth and sales and profits started coming back to the internet because in the beginning it was just like basically people pumping money into it and by 2000 people wanted to see money coming out of it but they didn't see that so they started slowing down their breaks and watching to see what's going to come out who's going to be a winner so that continued from 2003 to 2008 and while the economy itself the general economy would see a general recession by 2008 the internet e-commerce itself didn't suffer that much. It did, basically people saw that the cost of starting a business on the internet was so cheap that you can actually maintain and sustain a business without really putting too many resources into it. So if you look at from 2008, right, until today, it, nothing really has changed. This, it seems like, like, in fact, things have have grown, in fact, on the internet. Like most businesses are now trying to find a corner on the internet to make their presence felt. So from 2003 to the present, the e-commerce world has continually expanded. So we haven't really seen like a, a contraction really in, that, in this type of market. And that's the reason why they, they see it as the future. And e-commerce was really shopping on the web. And if you think about everything that you used to do in the 80s, where you used to do face to face, and in the 90s even, things have been taken to the internet now. So you don't have to really do these things face to face anymore. You can do it by doing transactions on the internet. If you know how to actually use email, you know how to use like um, a web browser, then you're in the game. Okay, so electronic commerce became the big thing. Okay, and the broader term of it e-business means that you can migrate most of your processes that you used to engage in face-to-face -face into an electronic world that you can start trusting really because a lot of people are engaged in it now. So the internet is the World Wide Web. And if you think about the internet, it's not only the World Wide Web, but it's also so a sub part of the World Wide Web. Now the World Wide Web is really WWW and it's really Part of the internet that we like to interact with because it's very graphic, it's very user friendly. But there's also part of the internet that's not so user friendly that uses codes only. Right? And I can think of like when I was in college at Stony Brook, we used to have our own access to Telnet. And Telnet is basically like a, a system for like accessing resources on the internet, but it's not quite the internet. It's the Telnet. It's, uh, <laughs> it's another version of the internet. Right, and it's it's not as friendly. It's it's black and red, I believe, at the time. They could have changed black and green. It's a black background with just words, and you would access resources that way. You can access your mail that way. And when you think of .com and www. is really like a graphics-driven internet, okay? Because it's like it's a sub part of the internet, but it's it's heavily driven by graphics and our mouse, this little thing here. Graphical user interface, they call it the GUI. Okay, and this interface allows for regular people to have access to this. You know, so you don't have to actually type codes to find resources on the internet anymore. It's very easily like click driven, if you may, right? So they, could, they, they break it down into dot coms, which are pure dot coms, companies that basically only were found on the internet, like amazon.com, for example. When it first started, you could only find it online. And because of this, people started breaking it down into how many different categories of dot-coms do you have? We have dot-coms for people. 
which we'll call business to consumer. So that's where most people would go, www.macy's.com. They can buy clothes there, www.amazon.com. You can buy music there and books, right? This was a business to consumer driven web shopping experience. But we also had B2B. B2B was like the dot com for businesses. So other businesses, they wanted to have access to people in China, for example, who were selling products in bulk. Think of it a Costco for businesses. And you would basically type in that website and make transactions on that website as a business and have a whole bunch of products sent to your home because you yourself are a business. So you would buy the product in bulk and sell them to consumers or retailers in a B2C market. But first you had to procure yourself with that or provide yourself with that with that product. So they call it e-procurement for that purpose because what you're really doing is getting a, a procurer you know, a provider of, of products right, to send it to you in bulk and you yourself would break it down and sell it to consumers and retail and B2C market. So those business processes, right, they prefer to supply management, which is procurement, right? And also other, other processes like recruiting, for example, right, which is also a B2B activity. And <clears throat> you would recruit people to work for you. And the way you would do it is by having people fill out uh, an application online instead so that you didn't have to meet them face to face and have them fill out the application face to face, right? So it's sort of like all the all the things that used to take place on the internet, all the things that you have to do face to face. Now you can put a computer in front of somebody and have the same process take place, and this made the process cheaper. So e-business was actually the major push behind why e-commerce was going to be big, because businesses saw it as cheaper, as a cheaper way of doing transactions. So if a transaction becomes cheaper, then they can actually pass on those savings to the customer. So this made the process itself and products themselves that people bought in the internet cheap. Okay? So that's part of the reason why it's, it, it becomes so cheap to buy things on the internet, even if there's shipping involved, believe it or not. So this is activities that, made, that were made cheaper by the internet and e-commerce we're gonna all move to the internet, okay? And the transaction is an exchange of value. So basically how you provide money or something of value so you can get something of value back delivered to your home, that's really considered, considered a transaction. If you were in a store, it would be, okay, you pick up a fruit, you look at it and see if it feels good, if it smells good, and then you go to the cashier and pay. But on the internet, there's no cashier. All you do is pick what you want with the risk of that fruit may not be so great, you know, but it'll be sent to your house and the convenience of it kind of like, you're like, you know what, I'll do it. <laughs> and that's basically how those business processes became more intensified on the internet because it made more sense to have them done on the internet. It helps people, <clears throat> people work more effectively and more efficiently. So that means that now, businesses see a real value in moving some of their processes online. If you think about the, the dollar volume compa compared to like the, what people were doing face-to-face, -face, for example, right? Think about e-commerce for business and e-commerce for people, right? The way businesses sell to people, right? And you'll, you'll see a huge difference in number. Right? Think about B2B. That means that businesses buying from each other and B2C businesses selling to people, people buying from businesses. The number is like hugely different. It's about 10 times more, right? So business consumer electronic commerce accounts for about one tenth of business to business commerce. So if you think about Businesses buy like $100 worth of stuff from each other, whereas people buy like $10 worth of stuff from, from, from businesses. So businesses found a real reason to actually do this because it made 
their process is cheaper. Okay, so that's really moving from a B2B business and making it consumer to consumer business because people are gonna see the business the, the values also by actually moving online. All right? So this gave birth to consumer to consumer. Consumer to consumer means that people are starting to realize that I don't have to stay in my neighborhood to sell things to people in my building. I can actually sell to people anywhere as long as I can find them. And website like eBay, like web auction sites they used to call them, right? Makes it even easier. eBay, Craigslist, you can just basically post your product, Poshmark, <laughs> right? And post your product and have somebody basically pay for it. And you send the product to them, have them pay the shipping themselves. So it's like, it makes perfect sense, right? So this gave birth to consumer to consumer uh, commerce, e-commerce, and this became a big thing on, on the internet. And when businesses realize that the government actually pays the most and spends the most, <laughs> So people started focusing actually on selling to government as a business, right? And so businesses, they were focusing mostly on getting contracts from the government and providing those services that the government needs, but using e-commerce to do it. So B2G became, became really big. Right? So B2G transactions included like B2B transactions because we consider, the, we consider like businesses and government to be like, almost like about the same because in terms of institutions they they spend about big money they spend big money so we, we, we put them in the same category so the categories we came up with b2c b2b right the business processes meaning like recruiting uh, i don't know filming you think about the videos that you see online now that you don't have to do face-to-face -face things webinars and stuff like that and then consumer to consumer transactions which allowed for people to sell to become businesses themselves because really if you think about a consumer to consumer that really means you become a business right so you really acting as a business is, and they really cause a call it consumer to consumer because you know it's, it's a regular consumer doing this <laughs> but now everybody can do business that way so you really a small b2c as well and then we have b2g which are businesses who focus on selling to government so those are different categories but there are really two major categories is B2B and B2C. Really. And what gave this more traction was electronic funds transfer of the 80s. And this started in the 70s, I understand, like when you first started have to, having wire transactions from bank to bank, you really had the first electronic transactions because instead of having a check delivered from a place, one place to the next place before People can say, oh, well, this check was endorsed. This, 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 the signature is the same and the account is the same. And we do believe this is the same person and we're going to transfer the money. It'll take about three days. Well, electronic funds transfer made this thing so much easier. Back in the 70s, people were just like, well, what's your account number? What's, you know, what's the transaction ID? And electronic funds, tra funds transfer became like the thing that made the internet so much easier for businesses and banks and cheaper also so they engage in it a lot okay they charge like twenty dollars for a wire and people could make money actually just providing that kind of service so now once electronic funds transfer became the thing they're like well what else can we transfer electronically so we can actually transfer electronically data so they became with this new thing called edi electronic data interchange so now EDI allows for people in the 80s, businesses in the 80s, to create a set of predefined fields where they would have the customer's name, the customer's application, and, and transfer their data instead, right? So we don't have to have applications between companies. All we have to do is agree of the fields that the names are going to go into and then just pass that information only, okay? So that EDI became the thing now. So we can actually create all sorts of EDI for all sorts of areas of commerce. And the EDI became like the thing. <clears throat> and just so you know, EDI didn't start by itself either because EDI started because of a system of transportation. If you look at, at, at the cyclists who actually used to be delivering those big 
media or big, I would call them those big bags of, <laughs> they would be uh, get on a bike and you'd see them like flashing down <coughs> Fifth Avenue or Sixth Avenue on a bike lane trying to get to the next building. They're really trans transporting like documents, okay? These documents are like, they have like a predefined way of, of sending these documents from place to place. So these other businesses, they have a way to register these documents in their own system, in their own electronic system. So these documents would come in a certain pre-formatted form. So this really was a transportation issue because you, if you see how big the bag was that these transported were carried, is because what's in it is 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 a big, <laughs> I would say, pre to find a data set that the other company would use to interface with their business to, to make it easier for, for them to get all that information in just one package, you know, and, and it's a bunch of information that businesses would transfer to each other that way. And um, it, it, if you have never seen the, the it looks like uh, people are carrying around like, um, I don't know uh, what I would call it. It's, it's like a big card or something like that. It's just huge. And these people would carry it on their backs. And sometimes it would fold. They would make it into like a, a big cylinder and and un, unwrap that cylinder. And it has all kinds of data in it. And you put that against, you know, some sort of interface that the other company has. And that made the data secure so that people couldn't actually steal what was in it. And at the same time, it, would, it made it easier for also for transport, okay? So understanding electronic data interchange is also a transportation issue, right? So we could get the data there faster. So the trading partners who engaged in this were called EDI partners, right? So if you had an EDI, you would have basically the same sort of setup on your end that the other company has on their end. So that your your data would talk to their data seamlessly. So you would agree on what certain fields would, would hold, for example, like social security number would be like a, a, a 12 field um, slot that contain numbers and, and dashes, right? So you have to have specific places for the dash and specific places for the numbers. And they had to kind of agree. And But you wouldn't be able to see that. It would be all melded in some sort of like data card, if you may. And that, that, that would be where that information would be, you know, available if you'd look close. So the EDI pioneers were like Walmart. And the reason they did this is because Walmart was like, was big on transportation and they they wanted to have some way of delivering their products just in time and they developed a system for getting their products you know and their orders you know delivered to their place to their to their um warehouses just in time they they, they, they developed what's called just in time delivery and they created a network that allowed for this right so the network would be called a, a value added network Right, so it would be like a, a, an electronic network that contains an interface that allows for that transportation not to have to take place anymore. Instead of having the biker on the bike pull, roll out, basically pull the car and then, you know transport it from place to place, it would create a, a network instead, you know, a place in the middle that would allow for this inter interchange to take place without having transportation issues. So EDI really was developed to cut down on transportation. Okay? And this transportation would take would take hours and it would have to have a human in the middle. And we wanted to eliminate that. And the human factor was always like the variable. So in order to eliminate the variable, we would replace it with some sort of electronic means. And that's what the value added network so from 1997 to 2000, more than 12,000 businesses were created. 
And from 2000 to 2003, more than 5,000 went out of business. So 7,000 were left. But just got to remember that. Even though 5,000 went out of business, almost half of them, right? These people are not going to give up. What you're going to see is uh, basically <laughs> it's like a survivor game, right? Some will survive, some will not survive. But the smaller ones who didn't survive, they're not going to give up. They're just going to go back in and try to do it better next time. And that's the thing people don't tell you about, you know, when it comes to doing business. Once you become an entrepreneur, it's more, almost like a virus. It's like a bug. Once it catches you, you don't want to stop. You want to. Because once you, it's like a first taste of freedom. Once you get it, you don't want to go back. And if you think of a child that was able to disrespect their parents once and realize that the parents are not going to retaliate and smack them in the head and continue to do it. But it's not quite as harsh, but <laughs> it's like, it's like a taste of freedom is like, it's, 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 it's infectious. You don't want to go back to work ever again for somebody else once you realize you can do business on your own and generate money on your own. So from 2003, from 2000 to 2003, people spent their money, but they were smarter in how they spent it. Okay, so they weren't just jumping in and just dropping money everywhere anymore. So people were very smart in how they did it. So the expansion you saw was like, you know, wherever there was opportunity. So the opportunities were from 2000 to 2003, they were mostly international. Because everybody else was like, because if you think about how this thing was really big in the 90s in the U.S., everybody else in the world was like, well, what about us? So everybody saw the else like, what about us? We want Internet, too. We want this, too. We want that, too. So from 2004 to 2009, it expanded internationally. So everybody got on board. It was fast. It was less expensive. Internet technologies became like ubiquitous, meaning you could find them everywhere. Routers, email routers, the, the big routers I was talking about, that used to be $25,000 back in the days. I used to use a router that was to deliver email from 2001 to 2004. And originally, I, it was called an iron port. And I, I developed this system for sending emails out to customers that we had. And we bought this iron port from this company. It was the first version of it. It was the A50. And originally it was used by MTV and they didn't like it, so they sent it back. So I got to use it and I kind of liked it. And we used it for free for a very long time. <laughs> we said we was gonna use it for, to check it out, but we used it for a whole year <laughs> without really paying for it. And eventually we bought the, the, the product for like, you know, it was already 50,000 and we bought it for like 20,000 or something like that. So it became something cheap that people were like, you know what, we can use this stuff. And people repurposed these machines also that were like super machines at first to do like simple tasks. And they became very good at it, like email delivery, for example. Email became a huge thing. And spamming became a huge, a huge thing also. From 2004, they stopped. They created like a, some sort of like law that says you cannot spam anymore. So from 2001, 2004, I was spamming like crazy. And in 2004, I kept going because all they did was create a way for people to say, well, if you don't want us to spam you anymore, just do an unsubscribe right here. And then that was it. But the unsubscribe just made you get more, even more spams. But that's another story. Anyway, people realize you can make money from exposure, right? So there's an interest now in advertising. So advertisers is like, you know what? If we could expose our products to the customer, it seems like they're buying it because it becomes a numbers game. So if like uh, 100,000 people see it, then 10 people are buying it. They're like, what? Really? That's how it works? It's, it, turn, it turns out that I'm not making this up. This is like when people realized the internet was mostly like a numbers game, people decided that, you know what? Exposure is what we need. Visibility is what we need. So technology's promised to make us visible. Now we have music, we have video, we have legal music distribution, we got legal video distribution. People making videos of videos. <laughs> I know people who like cut somebody else's video up and, and put something else on it and make it something else. And if you did that, if you modified the video enough, it became yours. So we talking about technologies being used over and over. So that's really web 2.0. Like when users now can use videos to make and become part of this content creation that is becoming the internet. So the shift became now to like whoever's first, right? 
now forget about who's first. But be, in the beginning, it was like whoever's first got got the goods because, like, if you were first in auction, for example, you became known as the auction website. So be, before everybody knew eBay as eBay, it was really an auction website, and it was an auction for like little Beanie Babies. People don't remember this. It was Cabbage Patch Kids and Beanie Babies that really made um, eBay popular because and people would just post things on there and see what people wanted to, to, to pay for it. And then as people wanted to pay for it, they bid on it, it became like an auction, and boom, eBay became the place. So now, people looking at the internet a little bit differently. It's like you don't have to be first anymore now because big companies like Yahoo, for example, that did search engines first, and there was other companies like Alta Vista, who are still around actually. And um, they actually do business searches. And these companies became like huge, right? But then other companies who did it a little bit better became even bigger. <laughs> so we, we had like Yahoo in 1995. That was like the search engine to go to. But by 97 and 98, it was Google because Google they made the search engine better, and they approached Yahoo. They said, "Um, you know what? You can make the search engine thing better. You know what I mean? Why don't you just buy us out, and I will show you how to do it better." Yahoo just kicked those young guys to the curve, and believe it or not, they came up under the same professor who, who helped build Yahoo. And this was this professor at I think I believe Stanford or one of those big schools in California, and the same professor coached two guys to, to that coached his first two guys to build Yahoo, coached the same two new guys two years later to build Google and put them in contact with each other. Now, this professor is super rich and he has investment in both, <laughs> in both companies. He introduced them and they're like, man, get out of here. So the, the Google guys became bigger because they went the extra step. They made something called relevance and the relevance part of the internet is something that till this day is dominating because people want to search for something that is relevant to their experience so google did something smarter than what yahoo did instead of providing directory of links which is what yahoo was mostly a directory of links they made the search like what people would actually read you know people like where people would find value and where people found value is where Google stayed and they made the experience so much better. So they became the bigger set of search engine. So the second mouse gets the cheese now. So you don't have to be first anymore. And you can see this with also MySpace. MySpace was one of the first big social media websites, but it's not the, the only big, just so you know, I, I remember Black Planet in the late nineties was the biggest social media website, but it turned into something else. And, you know, MySpace, there was also High Five before that, which was like a Caribbean, mostly linked people who were trying to get to talk to each other for free on the Internet. So the social media websites were created, but MySpace was like one of the bigger ones. And you look at Facebook now, Facebook became bigger than MySpace. So the second mouse gets the cheese. Because if all you have to do is do it better, make it more relevant, more connected to people's lives, and you will gonna do it better. So the internet is not really about who does it first anymore, which was a misnomer, something that people thought in the beginning. So now we're having people calling it the third wave of e-commerce. The third wave of e-commerce is basically figuring out what are the factors that are gonna drive growth for the future. So the growth for the future was really mobile. Mobile means that. People want the internet everywhere they go, right? Instead of just on a computer at home or on a laptop somewhere, or having to lug around and plug into some network, we really want the internet on the go. So those are the factors that influence the third wave of e-commerce. And it's really about the mass of mobile users that are basically asking for internet on their, on their phone. And part of it has to do with the fact that people want to connect to social networking websites like Facebook and My, MySpace. And Luckily for everyone, people put those little apps on every phone that was out there. 
And people were like, you know what, that's what's going to drive it. So that's why social websites are really the main drivers for the third wave of e-commerce. People realize now that you can make things by soliciting other people to help you out. <laughs> that's what crowdsourcing. Wikipedia was created that way. Wikipedia, the guy that created Wikipedia, started another website, more commercial, and made it so that people can come and do the same thing, but it wasn't successful. Why? Because crowdsourcing, which is like something that people saw that themselves becoming stars at, if you post the best knowledge, people, that would reign for a very long time. And you can see this now in comments also, on videos on YouTube, people would rush to make the first comment on YouTube because they realized that the first comment will show up first. Now that's not, the, it's not the case anymore. <laughs> You know, like the last comments will show up now. The most recent comments will show up, but back in the days, people want to see themselves first, like being the first to make a comment on something. So that was what influenced crowdsourcing, right? Because people wanted to be first. But it got more complicated. People now can track all sorts of things. They can track you on your phone. They can track products. They can track everything through RFIDs. These are biometric devices that are implanted in your phone, that are implanted in, in, um, in computer products, that are implanted in boxes for delivery. And you can actually track products throughout this network called the internet, and you can find out where your products are. Now, you know that US, UPS has been doing this for a very long time because that's how they have these big little phone looking things that tells you that well you know your product is on its way now and that was invented a long time ago but think about everybody being able to do that so that doesn't make ups as special anymore right and the fact that they can track things through their little big phone now everybody can track things that way so the characteristics of the third wave of e-commerce were going to be predicated by language why because we want the whole world to be able to participate so language is going to be a big deal. And also how people want to do business internationally. So we have to take it, the culture into effect as well. And connection technologies is going to be a big, a big deal because not everybody has fast internet. So some people have faster internet than others. So we have to create a way to connect everybody without having those lags, right? Because that first mover advantage is good, whereas old Old sites that are trusted, like eBay, are still going to be like relied upon. You know, it's, it's still going to be around. People are still going to look at them as like the first, the first place they ever bought their little beanie babies. And at the same time, there could be other sites that are going to come up. They're not going to be like as popular, but they're going to start actually get traction as well. As long as people notice that they're around for a long time, and other people talk about them in a positive manner. So now other people's participation on the internet becomes even more important. So what people are saying about businesses are even more important. So when somebody says, yes, this is a good movie, or yes, this is a good product, or yes, this is a good um, website to purchase on, now other people are believing this. This was the part of the social media aspect of the internet that people didn't expect, the power of the users. So now business models have to change a little bit. right? So you can think of business models in the first wave of e-commerce became becoming a dot com was important enough that once you're dot com, people are going to find you. But it's not the same anymore because now a lot of dot coms have failed, right? Instead of just copying somebody else's dot com model and think you're going to be doing the same thing and become a king on the internet, that wasn't happening anymore. Okay, so businesses now have to find a way to make businesses better for themselves, make transactions better for the customers, okay? And revenue models cropped out of that. So however you, you feel like you were making money, that became your revenue model, right? Your business model really is your revenue model, how you make money. You can generate money two ways. You can generate money by selling something to the customer, or you can generate money by finding a place where the customer can, can find their products. And you referring that customer, you can make money that way. That gave birth to affiliate marketing. So even if you couldn't even make money, yourself selling a product, you could become an affiliate of a company who sells products, and then you can offer those products to your customers. So you can make money that way. Man, that made everybody a business person, okay? So now 
All you have to do is really focus on a specific process, a very tiny part of the internet, and focus on that, and you can make money. So people are like, what? Yeah, it's like, yeah. You could just talk about something and make money from that. They're like, really? It's like, yeah, you can do that. How do you do that? Well, you know, focus on that small process. If you could find materials you can purchase at a cheap, you know, rate and make the process cheaper for somebody to get and resell it, then you can make money. That's what basically people have been doing for years to make money, but except that in, in, in the real world, companies have to actually have big money to do this. But on the internet world, you don't really have to have a lot of money because the price is so much cheaper. Okay? So those are really the benefits of e-commerce. One of the things that people realize that is you can just do something called merchandising. This is something that if you go to CVS, for example, you go buy Pampers and you like late night, you, you get the Pampers and you're like, how come there's a six pack of Corona staring at me right here, right next to the Pampers? You realize that this is called merchandising because they realize at three in the morning, the person who's buying Pampers or, or, or milk products for the mother is not the mother feeding the baby. It's going to be the father waking up at three o'clock in the morning. And if he woke up at three o'clock in the morning, more than likely, he's going to want to go back to sleep and a beer would be a very good <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> so that's basically what merchandising is. Pairing things together that go well together without really people understanding why you would, they would go well together. But if you think about the target customer who actually is picking up those products, they do go well together. It's like chicken wings and ranch or blue cheese sauce. I don't know. <laughs> so that's that's basically how people realize that you know merchandising is going to be very important in how you do things on the internet. So products that were suited for the internet became products that you can put well together that people don't really need to like examine too much before they make the purchase, right? Like uh, CDs, for example, like uh, a book, for example. Like if you go to like a, a library or a bookstore. I used to go to like Metropolitan Avenue and just check out Barnes and Nobles all the time. And I would sit there and read for hours, but mostly because I didn't want to pay for those books, you know, and I wanted to get the knowledge anyway. I would just basically go in the back in the periodicals and just open the book and take notes. But if you think about how people are buying books now, on the internet, it's just pretty cool. Basically, they got a synopsis of, of the book. And you get to read a little bit of it. You get to read almost like the first chapter of the book, really, before you even purchase it. And if you like it, why not? Right? And just purchase it. So it, that's kind of like the way um, bookstores did it also. So if you, you couldn't finish the book <laughs> in the bookstore, then you would take it with you and purchase it. Right? That's the idea. So products that were very well suited for e-commerce were like products that would lend themselves to this sort of process. So e-commerce products were like, you know, coming together like so quickly, like people realized that uh, CDs work, you know, as long as you had good reputation, software works, right? Because if it's on CD, then you could actually deliver it electronically as long as people had the bandwidth to deliver it. And videos kind of work, online shipment, tracking information, on the internet works. All these things that gives people confidence that their product is coming to them, they basically melded them together so that you could feel better about making purchases on the internet. So this was like genius, basically, right? So people figuring it out. And Amazon was actually the, 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 the leader in that. And, and Amazon.com had started building its own reputation, right? They had a strong brand reputation. And if you found a product on Amazon, it really did get to your house. So it wasn't like a fake. People were just, weren't just taking your money. So visibility and reputation on the internet also goes hand in hand. So you could actually, when you treat people good, have them say great things about you on the internet. And other people read those comments and people are like, wow, I think I should probably feel confident enough to do this. And I have to tell you, I was one of those people. If I didn't hear the truth in those comments, I thought the comment was 
being made up or like fake. Or the, I didn't hear a long enough story. I thought it was fake. It was a fake comment. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a purchase. Okay, so it's, it's important to understand that why the internet becomes so big and so trusted all the time. And traditional commerce was better suited for products that rely on personal selling. So like if I was gonna sell you a plot, you know, to bury or bury a burial plot for when you get older, like now I want you to take me to the place to see what I'm buying. If I'm buying a house, I wanna go to that place. You know, like things that re rely on like person to person interaction and seeing and believing and all of that stuff. Those products weren't well suited for the internet, believe it or not. But people are realizing there's ways, there are ways. All you have to do is start building a reputation and have other people talk about you. So even though those things seem remote or like not ready for the internet yet, but somebody was seeing the picture, the big picture. They were seeing like food was gonna be sold on the internet because food being sold on the internet is very innovative, believe it or not. Hot food being sold on the internet through Grubhub or whatever, that's very innovative because it, it, everybody wasn't able to get every product from anywhere, any restaurant delivered to their house at any point in time. You had to rely on the, you know, the 20 minute route. If it wasn't 20 minutes away from your house, they would not deliver it to your house. 20 minutes or less. I know because I used to deliver pizza for Domino's back in 1991. And my friends used to call to make sure that I delivered pizza for them. And strategically they would call <laughs> and ask for me to deliver like four big pies of pizza. If I came 20 minutes late, you know, it was free. <laughs> so they would call at the very late time when I was really ready to check out and they'd be like, uh, yeah, we'd like Phil Jean to deliver for us. <laughs> if he doesn't come 20 minutes, then we get it for free, right? <laughs> that was the policy back then. Anyway, so yeah. So there definitely was opportunity for e-commerce. Virtual community was created, meaning like people from all over the place. Kind of like a, a crowdsource, but that's like people from all over the place and not having to be in one place, really gathering together in one website. That <clears throat> was very innovative. And that's what Facebook and all of those are. Now, the e-commerce opportunities created because of this. Now, if you see what other people are doing, then maybe you want to participate in that as well. So now, e-commerce community becomes part of the social community, the virtual community that uh, of, of people who want to purchase things, right? So they have like communities of like people who are engaging in certain lifestyles who purchase things. Like what? What are they doing? And then now you want to engage. If you think you're an athlete, you know, <laughs> you should wear athletes' clothing and <laughs> whatever. <laughs> That's the community you're part of, and that's what you wear. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's kind of crazy. But the benefits, they do extend to general society because electronic payments, tax refunds, and all these things have made things a lot easier and cheaper, and banking a lot cheaper, believe it or not, and a lot more accessible for everybody. Whereas before, you had to have to get this and that information, uh, open an account, you know, have an ATM card. Uh, it was a big deal back in the days and fraud and all of that stuff. People didn't trust anything. But now that everybody's doing it, why not? I know people who still don't know to this day how to open an ATM, uh, how to use an ATM card, because frankly, they never really understood it quite how. I watch people like, <laughs> go to the, <laughs> I'm like, you, you don't know how to use an ATM card. Wow, that's crazy. Anyway, but anyway, telecommuting it became the thing because it's cheap now to work from home. You don't have to pay to have people sit in the cubicle and pay insurance for them to take the train all the way down. It's because if they're in there with the work and they get hurt, you are kind of like responsible. So now they can stay right home and be safe. <laughs> yeah, as long as they have internet connection, they can log into the work website and take care of that work. That's really what makes it so much more appealing nowadays. And the way I'm speaking to you now, I'm just doing a pre-recording and, you know, I wasn't really keen on this at first, but with COVID and being sick all the time, I'm like, you know what, I might as well record these things because if I'm not able to actually present in a class one day, 
you know, might as well have the recording, right? <laughs> anyway, around this time, people usually ask me questions and like, what is telecommuting? Why? This and that. So I'm going to pause a little bit, give you a little bit of time. So telecommuting is like working from home and using your laptop or computer to access the work's website and still do the work necessary to get paid. Now you can get paid the same working from home or you get paid less working from home. There's always differential pay. If you work at night, I remember, you used to get paid more than working from nine to five. So I think there's probably differentials now, but after COVID it became the thing. So I think everybody's like, get paid the same basically, whether or not you work from home or face to face. In fact, people probably do better working from home now. That's what I pretend. <laughs> so products and services are available everywhere. <clears throat> and through electronic means, you are able to actually have access to those products and services. This is something that you wouldn't normally be exposed to just being in a zip code that you lived in because you'd have to actually walk and find and go to your yellow pages and call people and and to find what what was available in your neighborhood, right? So it was not really the best thing for perishable food, right? Because you would only have like a certain amount of time to get the product in front of the customer. And with shipping, you know, and time that it takes for you to get the product to the customer, it would probably rot and stuff like that. But we've seen with fresh direct that you can actually have products delivered to people's houses as long as they are within the same zip code. And as long as the products themselves are picked up within a certain zip code, you can still get it to them fast enough. So now you have a whole different thing happening with location awareness. People are uh, aware that if you turn on your location, people can see where you are, then you can actually buy products within your location and see that it's not coming from too far and then you can trust that it's going to get to you fast enough and it's not going to be rot rotten by the time it gets to you. So those were the barriers that had to get over that people had to get over and they got over them. Okay. And there's also cultural barriers. Like people do not trust the internet, for example. And I'm one of those people. I, I didn't even trust cell phones at first. I had to be forced to get a cell phone in 2001. And my friends had cell phones since the nineties. And I was like, Psh, I don't want nobody to track me, but, as I realized that everybody was getting on the cell phone thing, I was like, you know what? 2001, I got my first cell phone. I was like, I was forced to get it. But mostly because I was stuck on the highway. And I had <laughs> and my car had conked out on me. And I pulled up on the highway. And I realized that the phone on the highway, I had to walk like a half a mile to get to a phone that could call somebody. I actually do need a cell phone. <laughs> so I, that's what I, like the next day, I think I got it. But those were cultural barriers. I didn't trust the internet. I didn't trust cell phones. You know, I didn't trust all of that stuff. But as I became more trusting, I became more comfortable with it. And I became one of those people who actually engaged more in it. I did more, and more transactions on the internet. I started believing in it more. Transaction costs reduced for me. And I started finding deals on the internet. And that's basically how you get into the e-commerce world. It, it, when you figure out the economics of it, you figure out like people you can reach, the, the money you can save. <laughs> the, the people you can reach is the market, how many people who, who, who want to, to find scarce resources. Basically, that's how economics are. Like, the scarce resources that you want to find, but once you realize how many resources are on the internet, you're like, you know what? That's economics. I have to really use that product because the product allows for me to get access to these other resources that I normally wouldn't have access to. The markets that it allows you to get the buyer and seller is a medium of exchange that allows me to get to those people. That's perfect. It gets me to the markets. And the higher I make the hierarchical organization that 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 it creates, it, it's not a big deal because now I can get access to the top hierarchies. I can get access to the boss. As long as I have the boss's email address, I can email the boss. So firms and companies, I can email them and I can send letters to them. So it wasn't the same as like going to the building and asking to speak to the boss. And then people are like, well, who are you? And if you don't look a certain way, then they won't give you the time of day. 
So transaction costs became cheaper. So electronic commerce became the place to actually, almost like a, 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 the field where everybody's equal. <laughs> You know, and you can send an email and sound as good as you want to sound, and people will listen to you and respond to your email. And transaction costs for from the pure simple point of creating sweaters, for example, looks like this. Let's say you have in the beginning, in order for Macy's to sell these nice sweaters, these nice um, Tommy Hilfiger sweaters, they had to go to different knitters right in the past to get them, those knitters to, to to build the sweaters that they want. And then ask the knitters basically how much you want for each sweater. And then buy it in bulk from them. And then have it from the sweater dealers. The, the dealer has to make money, right? So then Macy's will go to the sweater dealer and say, you know, how many different colors you have? They're like, well, you know, we have blue, green, and, and, and orange. And, um, and, you know, and they are this price, this price, and this price. And they'll go to different sweater dealers and try to deal with sweater dealers and before they even get it to their Macy's store, you know, the cost of having to deal with these different levels of people means that a sweater is going to be more expensive. Uh, Tommy Hilfiger is going to cost you like $60. But let's say we didn't have these hierarchies anymore. Okay? We didn't have people like selling sweaters for their own price. We could dictate to them how much they sell sweaters for based on how much we're buying from them, for example, then it would be different. So markets and hierarchies kind of like created some efficiencies when it comes to face-to-face -face because bureaucracies allow for certain things to work, for the machine to work more and less questions asked. But markets really are driven by prices and costs. So what they really want to do is reduce the cost to the customer ultimately. So what should we do if we really want to sell the cheapest sweaters or make the most money <laughs> selling sweaters? It's not necessarily that they want to pass the cost on to the customer or pass the, 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 the cost savings on to the customer. It's that they want to make the most money out of the transaction as possible too, as a business. So if the customer is accepting that they're buying sweaters for $60 and we're buying it for 50 bucks, how do we buy it for even less than that? Right, so we can make even more money as a profit. So this is what they're doing. We figure it out how to do this. If we invite them into our building and create hierarchies, then they are forced to work for us in a hierarchical organization, and they are forced to get paid a certain amount. Let's see how that would work. If we bought the knitters in-house in and we, we told them they're going to be shielded from the elements, they're going to work in a very quiet environment, they don't have to worry about people not paying them, we're not having a good day of sales, like in the previous case. They don't have to like worry about like the fact that they didn't sell sweaters today, so they have to give it up at a very cheap price today. Well, you get steady money if you work for us. So people started being creating big buildings, big factories, and say, you know what? Build those, build those sweaters inside my house instead. And then we have supervisors making sure that they can produce enough sweaters per hour to warrant paying them a certain amount per hour. Now we have hierarchies, and those hierarchies create efficiencies. Those efficiencies actually have to do with costs, because the business does not want to pay as much that the knitters want to get paid for their sweaters. So they created this big building and brought the knitters inside. They have a first-line supervisor, right? First-line supervisor supervises the knitters and make them work hard. They have middle managers who, who are asking the supervisors all the time, hey, you know, we need more sweaters, right? We need more of this color and that color and this and this. So now more demands are coming from middle managers and top managers. And then these people, they get to sell those to the retail clothing shops. Right? Now the retail clothing shops are still getting it at a, at a, at a premium. Okay? So they got to sell it to the, custom, to the customer at a premium. So markets and hierarchies are like, they go hand in hand. Markets is like, well, you know, that's what the market says. That's what you got to pay because the hierarchies are created. The supervisor's got to get paid. The top manager's got to get paid. And and, and workers got to get paid. Okay. Now, this trend kind of works except for commodities. Commodities, they have to be a certain price. People are not going to be willing to pay a certain more price for commodities. They're like, you know what? Commodities have 
to be cheap enough. So electronic commerce started taking over the commodities market. So for commodities, you could buy them on the internet. Why? Because it's all the same price. It doesn't have to be more than that. And people expect to spend like, you know, $10 for, you know, for, for sandals and that's what it's gonna be. Okay, because if you get the information, so then we realize that ten dollars is what it costs, and that's what people are willing to pay, and that's what it is. So now people are trying to find other ways to cut down on costs. How else do we reduce costs? Well, we can reduce costs through employment. How we recruit people. How we recruit people back in the days used to be something that agencies provided. Like agencies would provide you with a worker, and they would have to pay that agency for six months. Every like they they pay for every worker that the agency provides to 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 a company, that company has to pay that agency for six months as the workers working there. Okay, that's like how companies make money. The headhunters, they'll charge companies for bringing send, sending them good employees. So when people realize that they could get employment without having to go through agencies, they went directly to the job and had no protection and basically went to for the job they wanted and made the money they wanted. But they also get fired. You know, there's no protection from the agencies that the agencies were providing. But they know there was no real protection to begin with, because if you didn't perform, you would get fired anyway. So it doesn't matter that you, you think that you were selling to people that, hey, you get protection from us. That's the reason why we're charging this and this and that. Whatever. Nowadays, you can go directly to the company and work directly from there, take a risk. You don't have to have no union, nobody representing you. And then, See what happens. So people want, didn't like that too much. They wanted to move to a more like network economic structure. Network economic structure says this. You know what? I don't need people until I need people. Because having employment and having people on all the time is not the best way to have people working for you. Really, because if you, if you look at the world, the world is like sometimes seasonal, like the retail market especially. People only buy during the seasons, right? During the holiday season, people will purchase stuff. And when it's not holidays, they will not purchase as much. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? So they will, will hire people when there's more people, you know, being hired. than when people are like basically working, <laughs> you know what I mean? So we need more people during those hours and less people during other hours when there's not many people work. So network organizations understand that. So they started providing people on those on, on demand basis. And what they've done is created a way for research firms to find the people they need when they need them. So instead of having knitters work for you and having people constantly on employment, because people started being smart and like, you know what, I work by the hour, I don't work by the job. So people started coming to work and, you know, just chilling for like three, four hours before they actually do some work. And then they work for like two hours and take like two hour breaks. And then in an eight hour job, people are working like two, three hours. <laughs> so, so people are realizing like, yo, we can take advantage of this, you know, and get paid. <laughs> so now organizations are getting smarter. They're like, you know what? We'll get you when we need you. We'll, we'll get the custom knitters. <laughs> so now the building is not made up of knitters working in the building anymore. So we have top managers and, and sweater traders. <laughs> What they do is they sell clothing the same way to Macy's and the different outlets. But what they're doing now, they're getting smarter. They're buying information from research firms. What kind of information do they need? They need information to know when the market needs more people, when the market needs more sweaters, who needs more sweaters, who's buying the sweaters at bulk, who's paying the most information for those sweaters, and when is the best time. <laughs> so, And this research firm also is actually selling them information about where to find the best knitters, who are the best knitters, who have the best quality sweaters, who provide the best quality sweaters for the cheapest price, and who do we go to who still doesn't have regulations and, and laws to, to make the cost of sweaters go up. So that's why they go to places like China, India, where you know there's no real labor laws, where people could still buy stuff very cheaply and, and make a huge profit out of it. So they're like, wow, if we buy information instead, We'd be better off. That's what the economic structure becomes now. It's a network economic form of organization. So that means what? The network is really the internet. 
that's really what we're seeing. So meaning I don't need stuff until I actually need the stuff. And then when I need it, I just go on the network and find it and Google it. And that's the reason why e-commerce is so popular now because it's given way to like a more cost efficient way of doing business because of its networks, okay? Because a network allows for you to connect to anywhere, anybody in any organization from all over the world. Whereas before you were looking for something for a big business and it would say no to you, there's another small business saying yes to you right away. So that network effect is really what makes the internet so great. And they call this network effect. And this is a network effect. The network effect works this way. There's something called law of diminishing return. Law of diminishing return works this way. And the network effect, the exact opposite. <laughs> the law of diminishing return works this way. If I'm hungry right now, I could eat 10 burgers. Yeah, I feel like I could eat 10 burgers. But after the second one, I'm ready to stop, right? But that's because I felt so hungry at first. Whereas the network effect works the opposite way. The more you add to the network, the more valuable the network becomes to every single person on the network. So it's almost like as soon as you add some other piece to the network, people feel like, oh, wow, I didn't know this existed. I want more. And then now, because of that, that gives birth to other things. And that's the reason why the internet is constantly growing and it's constantly growing and recycling itself because people always have needs for things. And those needs, they do not get met, not all the time. And even if they get met today, tomorrow, other people have those same exact needs. That's the reason why you should start an e-business. The first class, the first week, I've asked for you to start a, a blog on WordPress. And mostly because I just want you to get used to creating content. And people don't know you can get paid off of content itself by providing ads. All you have to do is focus on keywords that pay the most. I'll get into that more later. But there's certain keywords that just the advertisement on those keywords will pay you as much as if you were selling a real product. And that's no joke. So that means all you have to really do is create like long content, long thesis, basically. Right. On, on things that you can write about. You can write about things for a long time. You can talk about them. It's basically the same thing. So if you feel an expert in any products that can have certain keywords that will allow you to make money, that's really what I want you to focus on. That's why I'm saying WordPress, because WordPress is, is the platform that creates more than 50 percent of the websites on the Internet. Now, so you might as well use it. And I've been pumping WordPress since 2004. <laughs> so if you could imagine that. That's like 17 years that I've been using WordPress. And there's other resources also that you can use on the internet to make yourself popular. So understanding this, you get why e-commerce is an opportunity for everybody. Because the more people add to the network, the more valuable the network becomes. So if there's something that people don't have, or there's something people wish to have, create it. And that's it. And people will come. <laughs> so to identify different opportunities, they say focus on specific business processes. Specific meaning like as small as it is, it doesn't matter. Don't think just because two people in your neighborhood are the only ones having a need for something like this means that it's a dead business. No, in fact, it might be the greatest business of all time because there's two people in your building and there's two people in the building across the street. And there's two people in every zip code that can have access to your, to your product. And guess what? That's two people that big businesses were not focusing on, okay? And that's why you focus on them, okay? And if two people in every zip code could translate into millions, <laughs> so don't worry about that. Create it. Even if it's just your little sister who has a need for this product, create it because there's somebody, other little sister out there with the same exact condition that wants it the same way. So activities become like, more like creating content for the internet to find out where people can find these opportunities, okay? And all sizes and all firms are realizing these opportunities everywhere, right? And a firm is really uh, a business that has multiple business units, right? Because if you think of Citibank, Citibank sells city cards, city cards, they also sell like uh, travelers checks back in the days. <laughs> It's like old school stuff. <laughs> anyway, 
they sell like business products, they sell, you know, credit card products, and they sell mortgages, they sell all kinds of other things, right? So if you think of a firm, they have multiple products that they're actually selling to probably some of the same people, okay? And an industry is multiple firms selling similar products. So people in banking, for example, like Chase, City, TD, Ameritrade, all of these, Robin Hood now, <laughs> they're all basically selling, you know, financial products. And that makes up the financial industry, okay? And that's very important to understand. So pick the industry you want to go into. And it might be a big one, but just find a little tiny area that you want to actually focus on and just crush that area. A value chain is created because when people understand that every piece of the chain adds value to the product and the final product ends up selling for whatever price it's selling for because at each point of the chain where you get the product, there's value added to it. That's really all it is. They call it a value chain because when you first get it as raw material, it's not as important until it's actually transformed. When it's raw material is transformed into something else, like when you transform copper into something that the cell phones can use to make phone calls with, the copper itself is not valuable to you, but as it's transformed and put into cell phones, it becomes more and more valuable. Okay, so then that is why the value chain exists. Okay, and all activities that are created uses a value chain, okay? The strategic business units that you see from designing to selling to the customer is actually on a value chain, okay? And because from the, the time they design the product, right? Conceptualize the product and design it and create a first prototype and create a, pro, a, a product based on a prototype and tested it with, with, with a group of people and started selling that product, all every part of this chain is where value is created. So that's why at the end, when the product is finally created, it costs a certain amount, okay? Because the value that's created by each chain makes the value of the product greater at the end of that chain. So all the activities that you think of that helps to create a product are called primary activities, right? When you design it, when you manufacture it, you produce it, and you end up delivering it to the to the customer, and then the customer experiences it for a certain amount of time, and then they themselves call for support when they couldn't use it. That creates value as well. And all of those things that go into creating that chain, that's what we're talking about, right? From the time the product was conceptualized all the way up until it's delivered to the customer. In order for this to happen, though, you need different departments, different functionalities in businesses. Some of the functionalities, for example, finance and administration. Finance and administration refers to money and people and buildings, right? So the finance part is the money part. So you can get the building and the rent and the, and the and, and air conditioning and, and desks and all of that. Administration is desks and people, how you're gonna you know, section off certain part of the building so that people will know who the boss is and all of that. And then we have human resources, which is where the people are going to come from. Human resources is who, who's basically going to be the filter. They're going to recruit from outside. They're going to bring people in. They're going to interview them to see if they fit in the organization. And then they're going to populate the different desks that are available. And then technology development activities. The technology development activities is becoming very important because now Every business has to have some sort of database where they rest and they store all their information about businesses. So they have to develop those technologies. Because they have to develop those technologies, it makes sense for them to also develop e-commerce and e-business activities. And because those are very closely related to technology development. So the industry value chain that you see is referred to by Michael Porter as Porter's value system. Michael Porter is like a, he's a big deal guy. He's from Harvard and he, he, he talked about this, you know, because he understood, you know, that's how things are created. He, he speaks about the larger activities that basically stream into a particular activity, right? So before you even get your cell phone, there's a whole bunch of mining that has to take place. There's a bunch of um, digging and mining and finding the right, the right, 
metals, right, that can help to us for us to create this electronic product. So all of that has to happen beforehand, before we can even get to like creating a cell phone. But for this, I'm gonna use a different example. We're gonna use chairs, for example, because it's a little bit complicated for me to explain to you why like cell phones use copper, but I could show you how a chair uses wood <laughs> and tree logs and stuff like that, right? So that's what we're gonna do. So a tree log, we cut the tree down, the tree logger, right? Person, timber, timber guys with the timberlands and those, those big shirts, those big red and <laughs> the lumberjack shirts. <laughs> they call them lumberjacks because they actually cut trees. And I, I just recently found out that <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, killers, these guys are also called killers, right? Because <laughs> if they cut, cut down a tree, they are basically killers. Anyway, uh, you could cut people down, you know what I mean? They don't know how to handle all that, all that stuff, axes and all. Anyway, so the logger would cut the tree down and, you, you know, and you put it through a sawmill and convert the tree into logs. The sawmill will basically shave down all the different parts of the tree that the branches are hanging out and start shaping the tree down in certain like planks, you know what I mean? And make it into smaller, smaller lumber, you know, shit, cut it a certain thickness. And then now you have lumber and the lumber yard would come in and take it and, and treat the wood and make it something that looks more closer to a chair and they will send it to a chair factory. You know, what the chair factory wants is different logs, different sizes, different widths, different, you know, and they get those specifications, you know, and then they buy them from, from the, from the lumber yard and they create like furniture, furniture out of it, like chairs, like <laughs> furniture chair. <laughs> and once they put those chairs together, they send them to like the furniture store, like Siemens. And suddenly Siemens is selling the chair for like, I don't know, $300. And people are like very happy that, you know, they cut down a tree in a forest and it's now they're making tree $300 out of it. And that's pretty crazy because the world provided with the tree for free. All of a sudden you're making $300 out of it. So that's basically resources. They buy those resources <laughs> and transform them and make them into whatever. Now, when people finish using those chairs and they have to throw them in the landfill, that's called a recycler. Somebody comes and gets it and disposes of it. And that tree hopefully is broken down again into, I don't know, tree bits. And they make something else out of it. So that's basically what the value chain is. The value chain is the fact that you take the, the tree that wasn't worth much at first, you cut it down and you shave the size and all of a sudden it's, it's cost more. And then I just make them into planks. And now all of a sudden it, it, it's still specification for that lumber yard and sell to like a chair factory, okay? And all these things are basically the different chains of the value, of the value chain, okay? So, and value is being added every single time that you make any transformation to a product, okay? And before you know how to do all of this, you need to know what your strengths and weaknesses are as a business, right? So that's what you do a SWOT analysis for, which is something I would like for you to do for next week. Those SWOT analysis, those SWOT analysis for yourself as an entrepreneur. So like if you were about to start at like an e-business today, like you started blogging today, what are your strengths, for example? What do you think you're strong in? What do you like to do? What do you like to talk about? What do your friends come to you for? What is something that you could talk about for hours and days at a time without really feeling tired as if it was laborious? Like it's like work. It's not work. It's like I could talk about this for hours. I know it sounds like I'm teaching and I'm struggling, but I've done this so long. And, you know, because I'm recording by myself, I usually have interaction with students. It's a little bit more difficult now, but I'm, a, I'm imagining that all my past experiences, the things, the questions you will ask, and that's basically how I'm actually conducting this. So things that you can do on your own without really needing any preparation for, what would you do, right? And that's the idea of blogging. Start blogging about that, start talking about Purses. If that's purses, is like your, your your expertise. You've been watching purses for so long, and you think you can design a nice purse that's better than everybody else's purse. And you could basically start by criticizing the purses you've had, and take pictures of them. It's like, look at this purse I had. And this purse it didn't even last me like six weeks. Why? Because I, I knew it wasn't gonna last six weeks because the 
the stitching. I could tell by the stitching it wasn't going to last or, or whatever. Point is, there's a product out there that you're familiar with. There's things out there that you like, there's, you know, and you can easily blog about them for hours and hours and 350 words at a time. And that's basically what I want you to do. So SWOT analysis is basically determining what you're strong in, what you like to do, what you could do for hours. Right? Figure those things out. As far as an entrepreneur goes, really just figure out how you can create content for people on the internet who need it. Just remember, you're not creating content for yourself or people like yourself. You're creating content for people who are coming after you. Because the internet is constantly growing, not because old people are dying <laughs> or getting on. No, it's because, it's because young people are now getting on. And there's a set of young people turning 18 all the time who have all of a sudden driver's licenses and credit cards and they need to buy stuff and they need to feel comfortable buying stuff. And that's the reason why you're creating all this stuff. Okay? Just remember that. It's not always for the new people. It's not always for the old people, but it's always for the newer people. And don't worry about the old people. If the old people find it like that, I mean, that's, that's, that's a compliment. <laughs> so find your strengths, okay? Define your weaknesses as well. Some things that you don't like to do. And you know what? Start challenging yourself to do those things because you're going to turn those weaknesses into strengths because part of this world is experiencing both sides of the world, not running away from the things you don't like, okay? Running away doesn't do anything, you know, just, you know, face your fears at least once and try it out. You know, so what? You don't like it. Just do it anyway. You may find something on the other side of it. The experience is, is going to be like unrivaled. So just do it anyway. Your weaknesses, try to turn them into strengths, basically is what I'm saying. And from those strengths, you, you will discover new opportunities. New opportunities will come up because of things that people like about you, about how the way you deliver your product, or the way you talk. And I have to tell you, even though I'm teaching you from this, these slides, it's invaluable the way I'm delivering because I've done it for so long and differently every time that after like 15 years, it's coming to me a little bit different. Even though I'm a little nervous today because I'm talking to myself and just talking to the computer, but I, I can get over that quickly. <laughs> I just got to imagine there's people around me. That's why I laugh so hard every once in a while. Just, just to imagine that you guys are like, man, this guy's crazy. He's talking for like hours and like, she's not taking a break. No, I'm not taking a break. I want you to pause every time you want, you want to take a break because I'm going to keep going. Because the point is not really to stop all the time. You know what I mean, the point is like, you have the right to stop me anytime you want. So just use your own discretion. <laughs> and uh, the little things I tell you in the middle is just like, just to keep it spicy. That's all. But yeah. Strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And the opportunities generally will flow from your strengths, right? So whatever you do well, whatever companies do well, that's where the opportunities are gonna come from. If there's a trend towards what you do well, make sure you identify those trends and try to align yourself with it somehow, because that's the idea, right? It just put yourself, ride the wave, as I say, I've heard young, young people say it nowadays, just ride the new wave. If there's a wave coming, Look at what it is and get on that wave. Don't worry about it. And just act like you was already on that wave before the wave started. <laughs> there's a weaknesses that you there's a weakness that you don't like. All right. Try to turn it into a strength and just turn it into an opportunity. Because those weaknesses, people are gonna notice them and exploit them. And that's gonna be a weakness that's gonna cost you. That's the reason why you have to turn them into strengths. Because your weaknesses that as you see them, other people see them as well. Okay. If you don't like to listen to people, you know what? Be become more of a listener. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't like to talk, become more of a talker. Right? If you don't like to put your face out there, start filming yourself. You know what I mean? And if you don't like the way you look, make an uh, an emoji of it, and you can still look all right in an emoji. <laughs> make an avatar of yourself. Make a cartoon of yourself. Whatever it is, just get over that. You know what I mean? Because you may not look good, but you may have a great voice. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of something. But anyway, do an animation of yourself. Whatever it is, the point is you do something to overcome your fears or your weaknesses. That's the idea. And then turn those into opportunities. Okay? That's the point. So the last thing I'd like to get to is the fact that 
you don't know what customers desire sometimes, but as you create them, they will come. So never stop creating, you know, creating is the idea. And even if you create something that you don't, you don't particularly like, make a joke of it, you know, just say, you know what, this is when I was creating and I wasn't good and make something else to say, you know what, and I think I'm getting better. Look how I used to be before, look how I am now. So whatever it is that you created, never think of it as something that should not be shared with the world. You just gotta be strategic in how you share it and it will all find its place on the internet. Because people have fails, so what? Put it in part of your fails. But it'll all be your fail and get money off the clicks, at least. People will laugh at you, but you'll get money. <laughs> in the third wave of e-commerce, companies like, well, countries like China and Brazil are seeing the next growth. Why? Because those, those countries, and just so you know, Africa right now, and the Africans are like, whew, there's no telling what's happening right now. But anyway, those are going to be the, where you're going to see some growth areas. So don't think about that the world that you're currently in. Think about the world who has not gotten some of the things you've already gotten here in this country. And that's really where you're going to see the opportunity. I know a friend of mine who's used to sell like iPads, right, from here. And he would basically send them to Trinidad. And he would sell them in Trinidad for $2,000, for 2,000 US dollars. And he would buy them here for like $700. And the turnaround, the margin of profit was huge. And he would do it like, that's all he would do. He would just basically take trips to Trinidad, buy a whole bunch of iPads here and take them to Trinidad. And, buy, and I'm like, what? There's opportunities like that all over the place, okay? Don't think of it like, it's like, oh, well, iPads, who wants iPads now? No, not here, not in your house. But guess what? Somebody else doesn't have it. And if they have it, they don't have the software. So load it up with software that, that people might need, like educational stuff, for example, that might come free to you here. But they, people in other countries, they don't have those things. And when you sell it to them, you package it that way. You package it as if something that they can use readily for education. Anyway, opportunity is going to be out there for you. And I want you to understand how the Internet is doing right now in terms of like proportion of people selling B2C. B2C means like businesses to consumers. We, well, this is back in 2014, so this is old figures. Right now, I would say that figure is probably reversed between the United States and China. China is probably selling 40. Oh, it was already that way. <laughs> well, yeah, this is probably still true. I, if somebody finds a new figure, please post it for me on the discussion board. All right. But yeah. We are selling 31% to the rest of the world. China is 40%, Europe is 20%, and the rest of the world about 9% see sales. So I don't know if this is still true. These are old figures. The issue of trust on the internet is going away because as soon as, soon as everybody sees the little lock on the website, if it's HTTPS, they know it's secure. If there's a certificate, so make sure that if you create a website, make sure that it's secure. Don't make it like one of those websites that says, oh, you know, you sure you want to go there? I don't know. There might be viruses on the site. Make sure you have the trust issues resolved. Okay. Yeah, no, no. So that's the key issue. So web strangers don't matter anymore. As long as they see the little lock on it, they trust it nowadays. Language issues. Make sure you have a language translator. Like a Google translator is one of the best, one of the better ones. And you could provide that option for websites that you create so that people from other countries can find valuable and they can post in their own language and that language will be translated into English so that way everybody can benefit. Cultural issues. Just be aware that people from other countries are a little different than Americans and that they don't really like to offer as much as we offer. We, they don't like to talk as openly as we do and that you got to have provide a space for that. So people love their privacy. Some people love to feel comfortable. Some people love to feel like, you know, that they, they, they're not exposed. So just try to, you know, cultivate that with your customers because your, your customers are really your audience, the people you talk to who like what you're posting and stuff like that. Culture and government, a little bit different in that, you know, government dictates culture sometimes. So 
Do not try to offend government. Do not try to be political in the beginning, especially with foreign governments. Do not get into those. Even Google finds out and Facebook finds out that you can get cut off from 1.4 billion people in China just because China does not like you. So there's no reason for you to cut yourself off by making some silly comments about how you don't like Xi Jinping. All right. So the point is not even about that. The point is to expose your product to the rest of the world, make yourself successful. All right. So businesses generally, they don't get political. And that's something I'm going to tell you right now. Do not get political. All right. Because politics could make you money today and then lose you money tomorrow and lose you your whole website. If you think of Parler, you know, which has been taken off every platform. Nobody could download it anywhere anymore. You can find it nowhere anymore. You know, nobody wants to even host it or process credit cards, transactions for it. That can be a problem. Okay, so when you're creating things, remember that. Keep that in mind. Make it as clean as possible so that nobody has anything to complain about. And then you'll be all right. You'll be past all regulations. The infrastructure's already there, you know, and you don't have to worry about that. You know, everything can be posted now on YouTube. You can start your whole website based on YouTube. You could post your whole post your website based on Facebook. So infrastructures are there already. WordPress already has tons of templates for you to create your website in. For GoDaddy, if you as soon as you get like, like your little domain, you can get them. For students, you can get domains for Namecheap. Some of them are free for students. So make sure you get to free your free domains and start basically blogging. Okay, and that's gonna be my parting words for you because now I'm watch people buy cars and all of that stuff uh, right on the internet and in fact I bought my last car on the internet as well and it's funny you could do that nowadays because Carvana and other websites allow for you to just type in what you want and customize the product you want and, and then eventually it's, it generates an order right if you if you got a bank account a little deposit, you can check your bank out to see if the money is there, and then it sends it starts the process of getting your car sent. And because it's not just your car being bought that day, many cars being bought that day, they can actually package them together in a freight carrier. Once they freight put them in a freight carrier and they put in a freight forwarder, and basically the freight forwarder takes control of the international freight and tells the customs office how much products is coming from this country and it's going to be delivered to the United States or wherever you're going to be delivered to. And um, how much customs, you know, they expect to be paying, how much taxes and stuff like that they expect to pay. And all things have been checked out by the customs broker and the customs broker has, has checked with the bank accounts to see that money's there, money can be transferred and there is no restrictions. There's, the accounts have money in them and that transaction can go through. And once that is actually authorized, right, then Bonnet House can receive all the products for the domestic cars that you basically ordered from somewhere else. And eventually that product can get to you, to your house, okay? And this flow that you see here from the money, from your bank account to the seller and the seller to the customs office, customer's office, to the buyer's bank, making sure the buyer's bank can handle the transaction, the loan is approved, everything is approved. Then you have the physical flow of what happens when you make, when you make a purchase online. I hope this was a good presentation. I hope the quality of my voice wasn't too crazy. You know, sometimes I go up and down. I hope it wasn't too low. Hopefully you enjoy this. Make a comment for me on a discussion board, and then I will make the next one better. All right. So until next time, I will see you. Um, after this first chapter, I like to give an exam because these chapters are kind of dense. So please prepare for an exam this week. It's probably going to be like Thursday. We'll get like the whole 24 hours all day. It'll be essay driven. So I'm not asking you to copy and paste things that you search online. I'm asking you to read the book, read the first chapter, read the PowerPoints that I've given you and understand what you understand. Go over my little presentation and 
rewind, <laughs> rewind again and play it back and do not share this. This is not for you to share, okay? This is my material that I'm creating. I'm creating for other students. So do not try to share this and act like it's yours. And like, I'm going to tell you right now, this is Philogene's product. Do not dare share this. I'm sorry. I have to 